Hey Internet, he is risen. This episode of Worldview Everlasting is brought to you by the letter awesome. The numbers sweet action and issues etc. Talk radio for the thinking Christian. Issues etc. Org. Welcome to Worldview Everlasting. Must see internet. Yeah. And it is the week after the resurrection of our Lord, right into the middle of Easter tide, the 50 days leading up to Pentecost and the birth of the church in the season of Jesus' life. That is, from Christmas to Pentecost, the season of the year in which the church follows the walking, doing actions of Christ before we then enter into the season of the church, the rest of the year in which we follow the teachings of Christ and learn from our Lord's mouth what it is and what it means to be those who believe in who he is and what he's done. <laughs> Throughout this Easter tide, we're gonna find ourselves mainly in the Gospel of John, kind of as we've been through much of Lent, although we're going to dash into Luke a little bit next week. While in John, we're going to be focusing a lot on what Jesus says about himself and who he is, but this week we still have more of this Easter story, this resurrection story. We're particularly going to be looking at the passage which could be known as the institution of the office of the Holy Ministry, although few people in our day and age would see it as that because the denial of the office of the Holy Ministry is the great heresy of our day. At the center of our denial of church, being what it is, maybe more on that later, but is more commonly known as the pericope about doubting Thomas, which is really just terrible, terrible. Thomas confessed that Jesus was Lord and God, thereby showing that skepticism can lead to true faith. Not so much. More like showing that you cannot by your own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ your Lord or come to him, but you must be called by his voice, by his word, by the gospel. And until the Holy Spirit is sent on the day of Pentecost, even this confession is not with power to convert, but you must be called directly by Jesus himself. Once the Spirit is sent on Pentecost, fulfilling what we're given in today's text with the Spirit being breathed onto the apostolic ministry, then in fact the Spirit is active in the church, blowing to create faith in the death and resurrection of Christ and what it means for you. Yar? So now, it was the first day of the week. On the evening of that day, which day was this? The day in which Jesus has already appeared resurrected from the tomb to Mary Magdalene and called her by name, even though by sight she could see him but did not know who he was, he used his word to call her and make her a Christian, sending her to tell his brothers that he is risen from the dead. For Peter and John have also seen the tomb but have not understood, believed, John John believes and yet nobody believes and well this is kind of the whole thing what's the setup here important to remember that in John's gospel John is always working in pairs I know this kind of flies in the face of those of us who would prefer to read John as if it's Luke but John and Luke are two different books by different authors and sometimes they have different ways in which they write John is always pulling pieces together to give you pairs almost in a symbolic way to use the stories to play them off each other to highlight certain facts so for example early on in the gospel Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and the woman at the well comes to Jesus during the day. He's a male Jew, leader of the Pharisees who should believe and doesn't. She's a female Samaritan with seven husbands because she sleeps around and she kind of does believe in him. These two differences and their contradistinction play off each other to highlight a truth about who Jesus is and what he's done. In the same way, the royal official from Capernaum who has Jesus heal his child with the word is a parallel playoff of the invalid at the pool of Bethesda who doesn't even believe even after Jesus heals him. You have a crowd in Galilee that's a little bit different than the crowd in Jerusalem. You got the man born blind and you got Lazarus. And then you have Mary Magdalene and Thomas. And yeah, some of that I did get from this book that I disagreed with that other passage earlier on, meaning mystery community in the fourth gospel. It's okay, it's got some good stuff. A little weird though, you run into these libs who, uh, <laughs> did I say libs? I said libs. You run into these historical critics who don't believe that John actually wrote the gospel, but that it comes from the Johannine community who redacted, that is, edited and pasted together the gospel later in time in order to, uh, you know, develop their theology to create a religion for some reason. I'm not sure I get the motivation behind a lot of this. Anyhow, if you can just kind of read around that, this is a good introduction in my mind to symbolism in the fourth gospel because it does show you how John is working structurally with these stories which are entirely true in order to bring you some new nuggets, some new edges, some new perspectives perspective on the truth that's confessed in the other three Gospels. Oh, that's a mouthful. So it is on that day 
Resurrection Sunday, the first day of the week, in the evening, and the doors being locked for fear of the Jews, the disciples inside with no way in or out. Two things to say there. First, fear of the Jews. It's kind of easy to scoff them like, well, didn't they know that Jesus was risen? Hadn't they already seen the tomb? Well, remember that these same Pharisaical leaders, the Sanhedrin and so forth, who have Roman soldiers at their disposal have put a guard on this tomb because they believe the disciples are going to steal the body. And now that the body is missing, you can pretty much figure out what the disciples are going to know that the leaders of the Jews are going to think happened to the body. So that if they can find those disciples, they can find the body. And so there's a good reason to be afraid of the Jews at this point. Not meaning Jews by birth. The disciples were all Jews by birth too. They all have the blood of Abraham. We're talking about those who make it their religion to reject Jesus as their Messiah. Too bad that that's kind of what the word Jew came to mean in the first century, where Jews by blood became Christians and believed and others didn't and redefined the word Jew, which previously it just meant any Israelite born in Judah. Now I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but you get the point. John's not really a racist. I mean, you can't hate yourself uh, unless you're a wasp. <laughs> Ooh, yo. So the doors are locked. That means that there was no way in or out. And sorry, Calvin, um, no, there was not a back window that the disciples didn't know about. Jesus' human body is able to do things that normal human bodies don't do. Like say, appear in the middle of a room, in an upper room, that entirely locked without using doors or windows or so forth. Yes, Calvin really did say this. You don't believe me? You gotta go look it up. It is in the Institutes and oh my gosh, I had the reference. I had it saved in my computer for like ever just sitting in my email box because this awesome pastor named Brent McGuire, who first pointed this out to me, sent me an email so I could always prove, yes, Calvin really did say this and now I can't find the email and I have no idea and it's hot and I don't have enough time to look it up. So um, email Brent McGuire. He's an awesome pastor down in Texas and I'm sure he'd be happy to have 30,000 of you saying, hey, where's this at? It is in the Institutes. Calvin surmises that Jesus with his human body could not just appear in the middle of the room. He had to have a way in. Just like as Superman, he ascended into heaven and flew all the way to wherever he is now chained to the throne of God, which is why he can't come doing the Lord's Supper. And uh, yeah, that's really what Calvinist teaching teaches. And it's pretty messed up if you think about it because it denies the incarnation. Not going to get into all that today. I love you Calvinists. You're still Christians because most of you don't realize how felicitously inconsistent you are on this matter. But if you ever figure it out, you'll join us on our confession of the Lord's Supper. Guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I can't kick you when you're down. I feel bad. Okay. Uh <laughs> So Jesus just shows up in the middle of this room with the doors locked and says, Peace be with you. Hearken to shalom, as in eternal peace. This is seriously a proclamation of divine pardon and peace. This is an everlasting Sabbath rest. This is victory is mine. There is no thing that stands against you now. He's going to say it three times. And it is about eternity and rest forever with no more warfare, especially between us and God. Mm. When he had said this, he showed him his hands, which by the way, can mean the entire area of this so that if the spikes were here, which is probably true. The word hand includes that. Yeah. So again, don't let the historical critics get you down. They like to boast. Mm, they don't like to research. Not really. They prefer to speculate. Onward. He showed them his hands and his side, the place where just as the first Adam had been split so that his wife could be formed from him, so also this second and better Adam, who never sinned, was split so that by the water and blood which flowed, he could give birth to his new wife, his bride, the church. Hey, blood and water, baptism and sacrament. Whoa, means of grace. Hey, it's all right there in the Gospel of John. Believe me, there are three that testify, water, spirit, and blood, and these three agree. That is preaching, baptism, Baptism, supper for you to give you faith in the resurrected Christ. Kind of an aside, but he showed them the side. Mm. And they were glad when they saw this. They believed this is the Lord. But notice, they didn't believe immediately. First, he had said, peace be with you. And now he goes on to say, peace be with you. Proclamation, gospel, word creating faith. As the Father has apostled me, Jesus says, apostolkin, meaning to send, but not just to send, but to send in the place of, as pure and complete representation and more than representation, but his voice is the sender's voice. As the Father has apostled me, so I am going to pempo, another word that also means send, send you. What you have going on here is the creating of the apostolic office. So just as Jesus said, sent them saying, baptize and teach. Just on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and the cup and said, this is. So now he is saying to these 12, 11 at the time, I set you apart, not as a special estate, as if you actually contain within yourselves something more than any other Christian, for no, you are sinners too, as Peter well learned this past weekend. But no, I send you with my own estate 
as mine. I don't give it to you in substance. I still retain it. It's my office, the office of Christ's holy ministry. What I give to you is the power to speak it. Nothing more, nothing less. Your voice is my voice. How can I say this? Who gives man this authority? Jesus. As the Father apostled me, so I'm sending you right now. And when he had said this, he breathed. He nfu say sin, not your normal breathing word, because it's different than the word spirit. And yet, it's what's going on. He breathed upon them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive from afe me, as in divorce or send away, if you forgive, if you send away anybody's sins, they are sent away. They are forgiven. If you kratete, related to panto krator, almighty father, if you retain, bind, actively judge anybody's sin because they don't repent and don't want forgiveness, they are bound, judged, retained, even in heaven. This is the office of the keys given to the church, for the church, through the church, as an office to be put upon men who will use it for our good, to forgive we who believe, and to send away the wolves who refuse to repent. Yeah, This is such a touchy topic because there's been so much abuse of the office of the ministry in the past, and I gotta say, there's been so much abuse of the priesthood of all believers in the present. Everyone wants to set up these scenarios in which we're protecting each other from each other, but see, that really misses the point. Um, if you can't trust the guy, you shouldn't be in the office to begin with. I mean, how's he gonna be your shepherd if you can't trust him? And uh, people, if you don't want a shepherd, well, why, why are you a Christian? Because there's only one shepherd, and he's the good shepherd, and no, you don't get to tell him what he does. Yeah? As the Father sent Christ, so Christ sends the office of the ministry with the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive sins. The entire purpose of the pastoral office is what he does in our midst. It's for you, so that you might have a free conscience, knowing that you have confessed your sins to this man, and he, in the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ, has loosed them from heaven for you. you want a miracle? You want a voice from God? Go to confession. It's where it happens. Seriously? Now, there's more to the text, and so we got to move on. But Ro, now Thomas, one of these twelve, who was called twin, or Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. This proclamation, however, creates no faith. Why is this? Well, part of it is because they have not yet actually received the Holy Spirit in fullness and power on the day of Pentecost. Not that they don't have it at all, because they're believers in the first place. Can't get too dogmatic about it here. But more so because at this point in time, it still does require Christ himself to call you. He must say to you, believe in me. This is his creation of the witnesses by whose witness the rest of the world will come to believe. And Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the mark, and this is a little bit off here too, because in the Greek, it's not unless, it's aeon may. That is if not, but there's two ways to say no or not in the Greek, may and u. And these are highly particular so that if someone says, if not, if may, there's an implication of a super negative. That is, they don't expect it to be true. They don't expect it to happen. So he says, unless I see, because I don't think it's real, I can't possibly see it. Duh, this is stupid. If not, I see this thing, which is impossible. If I don't put my hands into his hands, into the type of the mark created by the nails, and place my finger into his side, I will by no means, and there he uses u may together, two no's is a double no, to absolutely, positively, without a shadow of a doubt, not even a little bit, insist he shall not believe. Now, I hate to break it to you guys, but this ain't doubt. <laughs> <laughs> this is flagrant, high-handed sin. This is not skepticism. This is arrogance. This is anger. Cynicism. Guy's a pagan. Eight days later. Eight days is a good thing. Eight is always the number of salvation. But still, eight days. I mean, this guy's in unbelief for eight days. What if he died during that time? Man, Jesus wasn't thinking about mission, was he? Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, What's he going to say? Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Go ahead, put your finger here. See my hands? Put out of your hand. Place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Do not be unfaithful, but be faithful. Get rid of your NIV where it says stop downing. That's absolutely wrong. It's stop being a pagan, crass, faithless dog. Be a child. Hear my voice. Rise from the dead. Believe. Now Thomas answers him, my Lord and my God, and I think there's a little room for debate here in terms of does he actually touch Jesus or does he just fall down and believe? I kind of lean on the side. He doesn't stick his hands into Jesus. I and mean, he could have. He was allowed to. Jesus said, go ahead and do it. But um, Jesus says, go ahead, do it. Here I am. It's me. Stop being an unbeliever. Believe. I give you faith. And Thomas is like, bam, my Lord and my God. You know? Yeah, he gets it. And Jesus even then says, and there's some room for debate here too, because if you're old school and stick with the Lutheran German translation, this is a statement, not a question, but I'm pretty confident it's a question. And just so you know, there's no question marks or periods in Greek. It's all up to your interpretation. Kind of makes it tough, but kind of makes it fun. Have you believed because you have seen, Jesus asks. And the answer is no. That's not why he believes, because seeing is not believing. Hearing is believing. The Word of God creates 
believing. Blessed are those who do not see and believe. Now certainly Thomas got to see and believe, no doubt about that, but that's not why he believes. He believes because the word of Christ himself has called him by the gospel, enlightened him with his gifts, sanctified and brought him into the true faith, where it will keep him with all the church in unity until the last day, including you. And this happens through the office of the holy ministry, sent into the world with these twelve to feed the sheep, teach the doctrine, preach the word, in season and out, forgive sins, retain sins. Judge not lest you should be judged, does not refer to the office of the holy ministry on matters which the divine word has revealed. Certainly pastors by their own estate are not able to make judgments about all things. That's just silly. Can we get over the hyper anti-sacerdotalism which acts as if Roman Catholicism is the real threat in America? It's not the real threat. The real threat is not believing that there's an office to forgive your sins. What does that leave you as your own priest before God? How's that working out? Guilt? Yes. See? The whole point. Baptism, supper, office. Together to give you forgiveness, to loose, send away your sins by the power of Jesus' word which he has sent as gospel for you. Now Jesus did many other things that are not recorded in the gospel of John, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and by believing have life in his name. That's all we got time for today. See you Friday.